Late on a Sunday night in 1970, police respond to an anonymous phone call. They're called to a domestic dispute at an address in North Omaha's Black Ghetto. The house seems abandoned. But to investigate further, the officers decide to go in. In the blast, one officer died and four were injured. A year later, two black radicals, David Rice and Edward Poindexter, were jailed for life for this bombing. Today they're still in jail and unlikely to be released. Both men believe they were framed. I was reminded constantly that we're going to get you, we're going to get you. Nigga, we're going to get you. We're not going to rest till we get you. So I said, well, good luck, you know. And uh, they were right, of course. On a winter evening in 1968, Kenneth and Caroline Olson prepare to play tennis. Two men rob them and order them to lie face down. Caroline Olson died in the attack. Geronimo Pratt, a young black power activist, was jailed for life for this murder. For more than 20 years, Pratt has maintained he is innocent. I didn't kill uh, Mrs. Olson. I didn't murder anyone. I'd rather for people not to listen to me. I'd rather for people to go to the facts. You could listen to what a person say all day but it's best to check the facts out. And the facts be, speaks for themselves. David Rice, Edward Poindexter, and Geronimo Pratt were prominent figures in the militant black power organization, the Black Panthers. All three men believe that they were framed by the police and the FBI because of their political activity. They say they are America's political prisoners. Geronimo Pratt was born in the Mississippi Delta town of Morgan City. During his childhood, the town was still segregated between black and white. Geronimo was sent to an all-black high school. When he left school at 17, Pratt volunteered for service in Vietnam. He served two years in action and was twice wounded. He was decorated for bravery and promoted to sergeant. Like many other black soldiers in Vietnam, Geronimo Pratt followed the progress of the civil rights struggle back home. I was standing on the bunker and the news came from uh, someone's radio that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And uh, it was an uh, um, automatic reaction from everyone. It, just, it was just a, a silence, a big silence. And, it was a very, uh, very sad, sad day. Even though Martin Luther King wasn't so much of our hero, he was our, 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 our mothers and fathers' heroes. Uh, <clears throat> because we were more, you know, we were more excited about the Malcolm X type, or the, the more, you know, fiery and militant, because, you know, of our age and, you know, persuasions. But uh, Martin had been killed, and, uh, something was about to happen. I mean, you just knew it. And that's something you knew you better have been, better have been on the right side of the fence and, and you knew you had to be involved because no one could escape it, you know. Appalled by Martin Luther King's assassination, Pratt left the army and returned to America. He joined the Black Panthers. 
The Black Panthers were a militant black power organization committed to revolutionary social change in America. They also urged the black community to defend itself against racial attacks. Organizing them and giving them political knowledge about the true situation and organizing them and teaching ourselves that we must arm ourselves. We have to put a shotgun in every door, from door to door, from block to block, from community to community, from city to city, from state to state, across this racist nation, so we can have the power in our hands. So we can have the power in our hands. Geronimo Pratt rose to head the Los Angeles chapter of the Panthers. Kathleen Cleaver was also a leading figure in the movement. It was a very, very tense time. People were followed, they were spied on, we felt the police were trying to destroy our organization and that we had no intention of letting that happen. It had the feeling of the early stages of a war. Everyone was very tense, very excited, and we were determined that this was the time to make a big revolutionary change. In July 1969, hostility between the Los Angeles police and the Panthers came to a head. After a 14-hour gun battle, the police arrested the Black Panther leadership, including Geronimo Pratt. Pratt was then charged with the tennis court murder, which had taken place three years before. This word-for-word -word transcript is the only record of his trial. We've used it to reconstruct the evidence which convicted Pratt in 1972. The key to the prosecution case was the evidence of a former Black Panther called Julius Butler. He testified in court that on the evening of December the 18th, 1968, Geronimo Pratt came to his apartment and produced a gun. Anybody see you? No. Then, according to Butler, Pratt confessed to him that he had just killed a woman on a tennis court. To back up Butler's testimony, there were two eyewitnesses. The first was a woman called Barbara Reed. Barbara Reed ran a shop near the scene of the murder. She testified that she remembered Geronimo Pratt coming into her shop with another man minutes before the shooting. The second eyewitness, Kenneth Olson, was the husband of the murdered woman. He identified Geronimo Pratt as one of the men who shot his wife. The prosecution then presented forensic evidence. A ballistics expert testified that bullets found on the tennis court matched with the gun belonging to Geronimo Pratt. The evidence seemed convincing, but even so, the jury took 10 days to reach a verdict. When we delivered our verdict, the jury foreman stood up and said that we had found him guilty. The defense attorneys uh, requested an individual polling of the jury and for each count, we had to indicate guilty. Uh, after we had done so, I believe it was four times, I don't remember exactly how many counts there were against him. As That day, by the way, he was in uh, hand and leg chains with prison clothes on, as he had not been during the trial before. And as he walked by us, he called us racist pigs. Even Pratt's defense team admit the prosecution had a good case. There were two eyewitnesses that claimed that uh, they could identify Pratt as the man who had committed the murder. Uh, although they were, they were shaken somewhat on cross-examination, still juries tend to regard eyewitness identification evidence as very solid. Uh, there was an alleged confession by Pratt to another member of the Black Panthers who was actually a man who was the principal witness against him at the trial claimed that Pratt had told him he had done it. And, uh, you know, those are, uh, those are strong lines of evidence. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not hard to see why he was convicted at the first trial, given what the prosecution was able to produce and what uh, the defense didn't know at the time. Geronimo Pratt has always said that on the night of the murder, he was 500 miles away from Los Angeles at the Black Panther headquarters in Oakland. At the trial, this alibi was not believed, but since then, new witnesses have been found. 
I remember that uh, Geronimo was in Oakland with me during the week of the murder. And I remember it because of the significant events that happened, but also because my job was to log people into central headquarters. I was in charge of security. I was the person that if you came, when people came from out of town and when Geronimo came, he had to check in with me in order to find out what was on the agenda. According to Landon Williams, on the night of the murder, there were a series of meetings around Oakland. Pratt attended them all. One meeting was held at the house of a white supporter of the Black Panthers. I'm certain about what happened during that period, uh, not from sitting back now and, and you know, sort of recollecting 20 years later, but when this, these things were happening, I got locked up. I was arrested by the Denver County Police and the FBI and locked into isolation for two and a half years from June 1969 through November, uh, no, through October 1971. And I had limited stimulus in contact with other people. So what I did was all these things, I continually ran, replayed these in my mind. So now, although uh, it's still 20 years later, there are impressions that were imprinted into my mind because it was all I had to deal with while I was in isolation. So I know emphatically that Geronimo wasn't in Los Angeles, but in fact was there with me in, 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 in uh, Oakland at that time. This confirmation of Pratt's alibi is just one part of a mass of new evidence found since the trial. Our investigation has now revealed serious flaws in every aspect of the prosecution case. Many members of the jury were apparently swayed to convict by the strength of the forensic evidence. But this is now highly suspect. At the trial, a ballistics expert called Dwayne Wolfer convinced the jury that shells found on the tennis court had been fired from Pratt's gun. But Wolfer's professional credibility is now in doubt. Oh, Dwayne Wolfer is rather notorious. Uh, he's mishandled some large cases, including the Robert Kennedy assassination and uh, some preliminary work on the Man Charles Manson murders and. Uh, um, other cases, in fact, the Court of Appeals called him incompetent, and uh, he was sued in connection with the Robert Kennedy case at one point and was deposed. And I read his deposition, and uh, I don't believe the man could pass a ninth grade science test, really. He was the forensic expert, though, for the prosecution in Pratt's trial. It isn't just defense lawyers who distrust Wolfert. In 1975, the California Appeal Court described his testimony as given with a reckless disregard for the truth and negligently false. The court said it was obvious Wolfer knew very little about what he was talking about. In the light of these judgments, Wolfer's ballistic testimony now appears worthless. Even at the time of the trial, the eyewitness identifications were questionable. Kenneth Olson, the husband of the murdered woman, and Barbara Reed, the hobby shop woman, both made their identifications several years after the murder. Mrs. Reed gave many conflicting descriptions of a man she admitted she saw for only a few seconds. On the night of the murder itself, she, uh, uh, a forensic drawing, an identikit type of thing was done by a police artist, and uh, the description of the short man that she gave then didn't uh, resemble Pratt at all, and at trial they were able to confront her with this old drawing, but she had to concede didn't look like Pratt at all, but she, she said, well, I remember him better now. That's, those were her words. The hobby shop woman was one of the shakiest witnesses the prosecution had. There's a joke that people always, that prejudice people say, oh, I, you can tell the difference between any black or any other ethnic group, they all look the same. I, I immediately thought of that when that woman began to speak. Uh, it was clear to me that in her mind, every black individual looked the same. Kenneth Olson was more convincing. In court, he showed no hesitation in identifying Pratt as one of the men who shot his wife. Mr. Olson was Obviously, I, um, an individual that we all felt for. We had seen pictures of his wife murdered and uh, uh, her dead body. So when he got up on the stand, the feeling that we had was, this is a man that, I mean, you almost felt guilty not believing him. Uh, but 
his his eyewitness was, I would say he's about 50-50 believable. There was one part of you that said, boy, if somebody was looking at me with a gun, I would remember what he looked like. And I remember the jury foreman saying, don't you think you'd remember the person that shot your wife? But it's recently emerged that a year before Pratt's trial, Kenneth Olson identified someone else as his wife's killer, a man who looked nothing like Geronimo Pratt. And he got up and said, that's the man who did it and pointed at Geronimo Pratt. That's devastating evidence. What the defense lawyers didn't know, what the jury never knew, is that a year before, in a police lineup room, he did the same thing. He said, that's the man who did it. And the voice convinces me. He was 100% sure. And he picked out someone totally different. He picked out a guy named Perkins, who the police never prosecuted. William Dunn is an appeal court judge who was outvoted in trying to grant Geronimo Pratt a new trial. The, the question is whether or not it would have made a difference to the jury that Olson had identified some other person. I think it might well have made a difference uh, for this reason. If uh, 12 people are sitting in judgment and the crucial issue is did the defendant uh, commit the, 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 the crime and it appears that the victim of the crime on a previous occasion when arguably his memory was better uh, was not sure in that he either identified somebody el else or said he couldn't positively identify the defendant it seems to me that ought to be made to the jury because it's a uh, it's an equivocal identification when you just say uh, at the time of trial yes the defendant did it and it's not made known to the jury that on a previous occasion you were not so sure uh, then it seems to me it makes a difference in terms of how they judge the case and how they judge your credibility. Without the discredited eyewitness and forensic evidence, the only testimony still linking Geronimo Pratt to the murder is that of Julius Butler. According to Butler, Pratt came straight to his apartment from the scene of the crime and confessed to the murder. Butler told the court that he was so worried by what he heard that he decided to make a written record of Pratt's confession. Butler then said that he telephoned a friend, Duane Rice, and arranged a meeting in order to give him the confession document for safekeeping. In a statement, Butler's friend, Duane Rice, explained what happened next. He said that just as Julius Butler was giving him the confession document, Two FBI men rushed forward and tried to take it from him. Rice says he was amazed that they appeared to know exactly what they were waiting for. This thing that was supposedly had taken place between just the two of them. Actually, there were at least two FBI agents present at the scene. Um, they had to have been called by Butler. Butler had set up the meeting with, with Rice at a certain street corner and uh, um, if, they were, if the FBI was present at that street corner at that very moment, it can only be because uh, uh, Butler had also called them. Was Butler, in fact, working for the FBI? At Pratt's trial, Butler was asked, on oath, whether he was an FBI informer. He repeatedly denied that he was. New evidence shows he was lying. During the period in question, Butler was meeting regularly with FBI agents as an informer. The FBI's own records, now released under the Freedom of Information Act, show Julius Butler was an FBI informant at the very time he first came forward with his story about Pratt's confession. For the information of San Francisco Division, captioned individual and admitted ex-member of the Black Panther Party, BBP, in Los Angeles, is furnishing information to the Los Angeles Division on a confidential basis. If, in fact, Jul Julio Butler was an FBI informant, it seems to me that would have made a substantial difference to the trier of fact, the jury. Uh, not from the standpoint that he was or wasn't an informant, but bearing upon his credibility. 
if he comes into court and testifies to one thing and it turns out that that testimony is untrue, then he has been, uh, he has engaged in duplicity in the courtroom. And if he engages in duplicity with regard to that, then arguably he might not have been totally truthful with regard to the essential testimony, which was that Mr. Pratt had uh, confessed to the uh, crime. Had I known whether that Julius Butler was an FBI informant, I would have uh, disregarded his testimony completely. I think it's um, unconscionable that we did not have the full evidence when we are asked to make a decision that has such an impact. And uh, in effect, we were made to be puppets. We were, they molded the case for us to hear what, what they wanted us to hear and not the whole story. And I feel duped. Not only was the jury not told that Julius Butler was an informer, they were not told about the existence of a secret FBI counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO was an illegal operation set up to destroy the Black Panthers. It used widespread bugging and surveillance, as well as a dirty tricks campaign against Panther leaders. Newly obtained documents reveal the scope of COINTELPRO operations against the Black Panther Party, the BPP. One directive orders. Officers are instructed to submit imaginative and hard-hitting counterintelligence measures aimed at crippling the BPP. Another FBI memorandum explains, Purpose of counterintelligence action is to disrupt the Black Panther Party, and it is immaterial whether facts exist to substantiate the charge. As leader of the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles, Geronimo Pratt was kept under constant surveillance. Documents from the FBI's Los Angeles office refer to a secret campaign to destroy him. Operation number one is designed to challenge the legitimacy of the authority exercised by Elmer Gerard Pratt, BPP Deputy Minister of Defense for Southern California. Constant consideration is given to the possibility of the utilization of counterintelligence measures with efforts being directed toward neutralizing Pratt as an effective BPP functionary. A few weeks before his trial, the Los Angeles FBI reviewed the Pratt case. Wes Swearingen was an FBI agent at the time. It was my personal feeling that the supervisor was explaining to us that, aha, we finally got someone that we're going to hang. In bureau terminology, it would be to neutralize. But my feeling was that, uh, Pratt is going to be framed for murder if they can get away with it. Geronimo Pratt has so far spent over 21 years in jail. Exceptionally, his first eight years were spent in solitary confinement. When I'm in a stressful situation, I think of my, which a lot of people do, my earlier uh, days when uh, Life wasn't so complex, you know, and I pull out those, those things that made me feel so good, you know. The uh, magnolias, you know, how the magnolias would come out in the summer and everything smelled, the whole, everything would smell, perfume. the shrimp boats, you know, the rivers, and I just like country, man, I just like the space. Well, of course, my mother, you know, I was my mother's boy, and uh, the, uh, the family, you know, what's their family feeling, everybody pulling together. And, I uh, miss my friends, I uh, miss, I just miss the, uh, I don't know if I could ever be a hunter again after, you know, after Vietnam, but uh, 
I used to love to hunt, but I really miss fishing, you know. I'm fishing that river. In spite of the overwhelming weight of new evidence, Geronimo Pratt's lawyers are pessimistic about his chances of freedom. He's a bunch of cowards in the Court of Appeals when it comes to political decisions. When it comes to political cases, the courts are afraid of the FBI. They're afraid of the political implications of a case like this. And they push it away. And the way to push it away is to say to the lawyers and Mr. Pratt, everything you raise is simply speculation. There's no proof. If these people had the guts to be honest, they say there's so much proof where shameless man ever spent a day in prison. You know, you ask the question, why would it concern me, a judge of the court, uh, whether Mr. Pratt or any individual got a fair trial? Uh, after all, that's my lifeblood. That's what I am. I'm a judge, and it's my job to see to it that people are treated fairly, that people are treated dispassionately in the courtroom. Uh, the judiciary is one of the foundational bases of a free society. And if you don't have, first of all, an independent judiciary, if you don't have a judiciary that has backbone, a judiciary that will look to see whether or not a person has a fair trial and will stand up and stand hard and fast against the current to make certain that people have a fair trial, you're not going to have a free society. If we allow one person to be treated unfairly because he's guilty, that is to say we conclude he's guilty before we really know, then that can happen to any of us. It can happen to you, it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone, and we don't want that. In the early 1970s, the police and the FBI stepped up the pressure on the black power movement. Across the country, black militants were arrested and brought to trial. In Omaha, Nebraska, David Rice and Edward Poindexter were arrested and tried for first degree murder. In part two, we investigate their case. partner and I had just finished a little uh, like a lunch break we never really went out of service we just ate while we were on duty um, got a big plate of barbecued ribs and sat in the projects and you know right in the area and ate them and uh, heard a call come out of a woman screaming a woman screaming for help possible rape in progress at an address at 28th in Ohio I didn't see anybody leaving the house or I didn't see anybody in the alley. And I walked over to the window and I was peeking in the window when I saw Officer Tess and Officer Menard walking from the kitchen to the front door area. We kind of worked our way through the rooms. I could tell where he was because of the flashlight. And Larry was about, I'm guessing 10, 12 feet in front of me and he had bent over the suitcase, and that's the last I remember of, of that. I don't like to see somebody get by them or murdering somebody. And uh, it's just plain and simple. You know, when you're investigating homicide, there's a saying that you are uh, in that man's shoes to see that he gets justice. And I always did believe that. You know, how is that dead man going to get justice if you don't do it for him? And that's my principle. A week after the bombing, Officer Larry Minard was buried. 
The police were convinced the Black Panthers were responsible for the killing. We were under constant surveillance, constant harassment. Uh, a great deal of energy and uh, <clears throat> resources were spent uh, on trying to provoke us into a confrontation. One, you know, involving shooting, of course. Uh, we couldn't leave. Uh, we couldn't leave a building and enter the streets without being frisked, uh, harassed. Uh, this went on around the clock. Not a night went by, man, that somebody wasn't absolutely, totally, unnecessarily pounced upon by the police. Not a night went by, man. This was like seven days a week. The Black Panthers published a newsletter called Freedom by Any Means Necessary. David Rice was the editor. We did on occasion talk about the whole business, you know, in the newsletter of, of having a right, well, we talk about it more than occasionally, about having a right to defend yourself against police attack. If we're talking about our competing and we're serious about this, then we're talking about urban guerrilla warfare and we're talking about people using their brains. And you don't use your brain by throwing some bottles and some bricks and some pigs and getting some cruises. You off the pig by the means that are available to you which can be easily obtained. Both David Rice and Ed Poindexter were visible in the community. And uh, David Rice was uh, very free about what he thought the answer to these problems were, and they generally included killing police officers. Uh, Ed Poindexter, not as vocal, was always present, always around. Marvin McClarity was one of the few black police officers in Omaha at that time. I know I had feelings that they were out to get those two because they were probably the most, uh, the, the two that were most vocal. They were the two that uh, people viewed as being a threat. The police did. Well, there wasn't a policeman on the job that didn't know who done that. It was just a matter of being able to prove it. And that's what we've done. A week after the bombing, officers Jim Perry and Jack Swanson led a raid on David Rice's house in North Omaha. Rice was in Kansas City giving a speech at the time. He'd left his house unlocked. Both Jim Perry and Jack Swanson later testified they found a box of dynamite in the basement. Other officers aren't so sure. Marvin McClarity is convinced the dynamite was planted after the area had been cordoned off. I was on duty. We saw them bringing uh, items out of that house. The thing that was so striking to me and to those uh, two officers that I was with was the fact that the police had blocked off uh, 29th to 30th on Parker Street. And they blocked that off to vehicular traffic and to pedestrian traffic. Then they said they found something in that house and uh, being a police officer, the first thing that strikes you is funny and saying, hey, something's wrong here because of the way that that search was conducted. And uh, that was when we drew our suspicions that it could have been something that was planted in that house. And uh, to this day, I still believe that was planted in that house. It's a lie. I was there. I found it. Uh, I didn't personally discover it, but I was there when it was discovered and went right to where it was. <laughs> it was there. They found dynamite in my house. I had guns, you know, in my house, but those guns were legal, you know, registered in my name. I would have been very cautious about even somebody pre presenting the idea of having something in my house, you know, that somebody could get some time for. Because I always suspected that there would be some kind of raid. Although the police had the dynamite they claimed to have found in David Rice's house, they lacked any firm evidence to link Rice to the bombing. The next stage in the investigation came when the police were tipped off that one of the bombers was a teenager called Dwayne Peake. Acting on information developed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, agents of the FBI and investigators of the Omaha Police Division arrested Dwayne Peake charging him with first-degree murder in the bombing death of patrolman Larry D. Menard. 
According to Dwayne Peake's uncle, once he was in custody, he told the police he'd made the bomb with members of his family. At that particular time, David Rice and Ed Poindexter's name wasn't even mentioned. Uh, it was sometime later, I guess in the morning, when people came in and they, they wanted some good, I, I believe it's scapegoats or however you want to put it, they wanted something sensationalized. They wanted to go after the people that, was, that were making headlines, I believe. According to his uncle, the police weren't interested in Dwayne Peake's story. They put pressure on him to implicate Rice and Poindexter in the bombing. There were statements made to Dwayne like, uh, you would be the youngest individual that would die in the electric chair. Um, there were statements like, um, you know, your family probably would suffer. Um, you killed a police officer and, you know, it was a frightful experience. So it was uh, very traumatic. Once he was arrested, he was like a whip puppy, and he, uh, according to what they told me, readily told them everything about what happened and how it happened. And he was just a young kid. He was only, I think, six, 15, 16 years old. Police mentality is when, once you hone in on a suspect, uh, you do all you can to bring that to uh, to court and to for the conviction. And sometimes we take shortcuts uh, in order to convict someone, and sometimes we just do things that are just right down dishonest. And I think that uh, once they uh, they honed in on David and uh, and Edward, that they just carried through and uh, and did it that way. After changing his story several times, Dwayne finally told the police it was Rice and Poindexter who'd made the bomb. He claimed the bomb had been made in David Rice's kitchen after Poindexter had brought a box of dynamite up from the basement. Dwayne also claimed Ed Poindexter told him to plant the bomb at an empty house in North Omaha. He went on to say, Poindexter gave him instructions to call the police to the house by dialing the emergency number from a payphone. I did not make that bomb. I didn't conspire with anybody to make it. I didn't put Dwayne Peake up to it, delivering it or having anything to do with it. In fact, the only thing that I said to, to Dwayne uh, during that period was go away, you're suspended, grow up, because he was displaying some very bizarre behavior at that time. Uh, I had absolutely nothing to do with him making that bomb. I don't know if I would have had whatever it takes uh, to do that, because I had never really seriously hurt anybody that I know of, uh, you know. And to take the step of killing somebody, uh, I don't know if I'd have been prepared to do that. On the basis of Dwayne's evidence, the police decided to charge Rice and Poindexter with the bombing. Many months later, in a wave of publicity, the murder trial was held. According to prosecuting attorney Sam Cooper, Dwayne Peake was the key to the prosecution case. The physical evidence, the, the dynamite, uh, that's all we would have had, I think, without Dwayne Peake. And I suspect would have been questionable whether you could have filed anything. It's pretty clear that absent the testimony of Dwayne Peake, it would have been a weak circumstantial case of murder. I mean, he was critical to the case. Dwayne Peake's appearance in court as a witness was eagerly awaited. His was the only evidence which directly linked Rice and Poindexter to the bombing. When Dwayne Peake walked into the courtroom that morning, uh, he appeared to be like any normal uh, young teenage uh, black person who uh, looked confident, uh, smiled and recognized individuals uh, in the courtroom. Dwayne Peake was called to the stand as a witness for the prosecution. His testimony stunned the court. But when he testified in the morning, uh, he denied any involvement on my part or Ed. Uh, 
regarding the whole question of, of talking about a bombing or, or, or constructing a bomb or any of this, and um, I guess my reaction was, damn, this little dude is stronger than I could have guessed because I, I know they've done some things to him or said some things to him that would scare the hell out of him. But somehow, he's not going along with the program. With those uh, shocking disclosures, shocking to the prosecution, the proceedings ended. Uh, at the request of the prosecutor who asked that the preliminary hearing be continued to the afternoon. Afternoon proceedings occurred, Dwayne Peake comes in wearing sunglasses, looking visibly shaken, changed. I asked Dwayne Peake to take off his sunglasses. His face around the eyes was swollen. It looked discolored to me. His eyes were red. It was clear he had been crying. And my impression at the time was that he had been struck physically, and that's what caused the discoloration and the marks around his eyes. When he took the glasses off, people in the courtroom let out an audible gasp. Dwayne Christopher Peake had been worked on, really worked on, between the morning session and the afternoon session. It was frightening to see what happened to that young man. If it were any other set of circumstances, were he accusing some white person of an offense and changed his story as many times and as many ways as he did, his testimony would have been considered so lacking in credibility that it would not have been used for any purpose whatsoever. But because there were certain words they wanted to come out of his mouth to implicate these black men, they could change it, orchestrate it, until they got those words from him. And once the words came from him that they wanted, his mouth became a prayer book. After Duane's changed testimony, the court session ended. That night, he wrote a letter home. They had me in court today. I guess you already know that by now. The Lord knows I tried, but something happened which forced me to realize that I had no alternative but to say what I said. Mama, I'm going through hell. I don't know what to do or how to do it or what to say or how to say it. I can't find the words to say to the people, I'm sorry. Most likely they'll probably prefer that I just die. I don't think I'll mind that at all. With love always, Dwayne C.P. The trial continued with the introduction of forensic evidence. After their arrest, Rice and Poindexter's hands had been tested for traces of explosives. These tests were negative. However, the prosecution's forensic expert claimed that dust particles in their clothes had tested positive for the presence of dynamite. But on cross-examination, he admitted that the tests carried out might not have been exclusively for dynamite. In fact, they could have registered positive from a range of other substances. To lend weight to his case, the prosecutor claimed that Ed Poindexter was an explosives expert who'd served in Vietnam. This was untrue. I was, I was a medical aid man most of that time, and then I was a mechanic. You know, no experience with explosives. You know, that was just, again, you know, uh, the press is um, uh, uh, in the FBI and the police department working in concert. That was their way of, of uh, making me look as, as, as bad as possible. You know, this guy must have done such a thing. Because look at him, you know, he looks like Milton. He's big, uh, burly, black. He got a beard where it shades, you know. He's, he's, he's a Vietnam veteran. He must have done it. Look at him, you know. And he talks mean. You know, those are the, the images they put in people's minds. And uh, it worked. After all the evidence had been heard, Ed Poindexter and David Rice were found guilty. Well, of course, uh, police officers in that situation are always going to think about the death penalty. Uh, at that time, that was not possible in Nebraska. The maximum sentence available was, was life, is, which, uh, is what uh, Rice and Poindexter both received. I was expecting it, but then, you know, there's no way you can pray com can, can prepare yourself emotionally for something like that, you know. Um, I was numb uh, for about an hour, and then after that, uh, anger set in and, and uh, resentment. David Rice and Edward Poindexter are still in jail. In Nebraska, there is no parole in life sentences. Dwayne Peake, who testified against them, spent four years in youth custody and was released in 1974. He then disappeared. 
However, 20 years on, new evidence has emerged. At the trial, Dwayne Peake testified he'd telephoned the police on Ed Poindexter's instructions. Members of his family now maintain it was not Dwayne who called the police. All emergency calls are recorded as a matter of course. But in the early 1970s, the Omaha police claimed the only tape recording of Dwayne Peake's call had been destroyed. But in fact, the operator on duty on the night of the bombing made his own copy of the call. When he died recently, this tape turned up in Omaha. This tape was played to people who remembered Dwayne's voice. Now, I had listened to Dwayne Christopher Peake testify for almost three days before the jury. I had taken two sets of depositions. I had sat with this young man for hours listening to him describe uh, his actions, his contentions, his recollections, and heard his voice and was saturated with his voice. It is my opinion now that the voice on that tape was not Dwayne Christopher Peake. When I heard this tape and realized that the deep voice of a much older man that I heard on this tape was the one they were saying was the voice of Dwayne Peake, this 15-year-old kid whose voice I knew, I couldn't believe it. Anybody who heard that tape would have to know that the whole story about Dwayne Peake having made a phone call to lure the police to that house would have known it was a lie. And for officials of the law enforcement branch to do something like that is reprehensible and inexcusable and the fact that they did that made it clear to all of us that they knew David and Ed were innocent. If the voice on the tape is not Dwayne Peaks, it's clear he was lying on oath. These newly obtained documents show the FBI was well aware of this perjury. The Omaha police and the FBI deliberately arranged for the tape recording to be suppressed because, in their words, it would be prejudicial to the case against Rice and Poindexter. In other words, they knew Peake was lying. Uh, we feel we got the two main players uh, in Rice and Poindexter. And uh, I think we did the right thing at the time because the Black Panther Party, or whatever, by whatever name it was going by at the time of the, uh, of the murder, completely disappeared from the city of Omaha. Everybody disassociated itself from the Black Panther Party or their uh, new names. And uh, it's sort of been the end of that sort of thing in the city of Omaha, and that's uh, 21 years ago. After the imprisonment of so many of its leaders, the Black Panthers were effectively crushed as a political force in America. COINTELPRO, the FBI's counterintelligence program which helped destroy the Panthers, came to an end with the resignation of President Nixon. But almost 20 years on, its victims remain in jail. I think that uh, Nixon, <clears throat> Hoover, and that whole, that whole gang were uh, adjudged to be criminals, and it was very clear uh, that they uh, participated in uh, quite a bit of criminal activity. They were, in fact, criminals. But what people failed to do was to follow through on not just saying, okay, he's a criminal, he did the wrong, and leave it at that. You have to go and look at the crimes that they committed and then um, um, clean it up, so to speak, uh, resolve the, you know, the problems that they had uh, begun, and that that has not been done, and not only in my case, but in quite a few cases.
Now, I'm just a regular guy like everybody, you know, like most of the guys are. And anybody with, with normal human emotions and feelings who would go through that type of thing would be bitter. In fact, if they weren't bitter, something would be wrong with them, you know. Something would be wrong upstairs if they weren't bitter, disappointed, angry. And I was at the time, um, especially in my first uh, two or three years in prison, uh, very much. But, you know, eventually you have to, uh, you have to uh, settle down and, you know, and realize that, hey, I, I'm here, I'm going to be here while, why not just try to make something good out of this time and, and learn and grow from the experience and come out a better person. So I don't regret anything I've done. And yeah, I, I paid a high price, um, but in a way you make your bed and you have to, to you know, to lie in it. Uh, if you talk bad about people who have things to hide, you know they're going to try to get you. and. You have to be prepared for that. I mean, I talk about it now like it's, you know, a fairly, like I'm, I, I don't I, I speak of, maybe I'm sounding like uh, it's no big thing. It obviously is a big thing. But, you know, but what, what can, you know, what can you do? You, you, you make certain choices, man. And, and depending on the kind of society that you live in, you know, they make you pay a price. So when I first came down here, I, I just kind of saw myself as a casualty of, of my own failure to to understand properly the, the seriousness of stuff. But after after a time, yeah, you know, I've said to myself a bunch of times, man, folks, you know, step forward, let me go, damn it. Despite the obvious injustice of their imprisonment, David Rice, Edward Poindexter and Geronimo Pratt have little chance of being released. Without a change of political will, they seem destined to remain in jail, living witnesses to the fallibility of America's system of justice. Thank mm -hmm. you.